Welcome to the No Picks After Dark podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Dante. Today, we have a very, very special guest. I am so excited to be at the Enoch Pratt Library. I can, I, this is the first time I've been to this library in 25 years. That is a shame. <laughs> 25 years. Welcome back. Thank you so much. And the person we have on the show, you know, you might know her. She's a local Baltimore celebrity. Okay. <laughs> she, you know, she was on TV. She was breaking, breaking, you know, breaking news and things of that nature. <laughs> but without further ado, welcome Megan McCorkle, a director of marketing and communication at Enat Free Library. Thank you for coming on No Picture Dark Podcast. Thank you so much for having me and welcome back to the library. Oh, this is a beautiful thing. I mean, you gave us a real quick tour. I mean, I'm blown away by just the lights and I'm like, I see why people come here all the time. It's really hard to be in a bad mood. Like when you walk in the door and you're in a place that is this gorgeous. So yeah, I always say like if something's got me down, I just go for a walk around the hallways and I'll be just fine when I get back to my office. I mean, I'm blown away. I felt like I was in Europe for a second walking through that middle hall, middle way. I'm like, I'm looking up like, they don't make them like this anymore. I mean, that's for sure. And they're actually, you're not far off because some of our ceilings are like modeled after churches in Rome. I, I mean, each room has like a little surprise for everybody and it's just gorgeous. It reminds me, I don't know if you've ever been to Barcelona. Uh, it's called La Familia, that oh. big church that's been, they've been building for like a hundred years. And it's just beautiful. And I got, I said, I, you know, myself, Nick and I were looking around like, this is serious. This is legit. So this is another hidden gem. So, you know, we're here. Thank you so much for having us here. Absolutely. All right, so we're going to get a little bit. We're going to find out a little bit about you first. All right, let's do it. Okay. Are you from Maryland? I am not from Maryland. I am from the great state of New Jersey uh, initially, so just up I-95 um, from the Jersey Shore. So I feel like the vibe is very similar. We like seafood. We like the ocean. We like the water. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm from New Jersey originally. I uh, went to college in D.C., but I have been in Baltimore for 10 years now. Wow. Well, wow. so I used to live in Jersey. I call it Jersey. <laughs> I call it, I lived in, uh, uh, where's it? Uh, Belmar? No, Manasquan. Okay. Uh, wow. Okay. Right the, down the street. The Parker house. I, I have, I see, you know, about the, Park. the Parker house. See, you know, too. <laughs> okay. So a uh, small world. I love it. I love it. I lived there for, uh, two years. Uh, worked in ocean township mm -hmm. off route 35. I used to go to Pete and Aldis for some pieces of thin crust. Yeah. I remember if you ate the really, really big pizza, you, you got a t-shirt. Yeah. I oh never, I never did. Somebody, we <laughs> cheated when we were kids, we would take the pizza and we would line our pocketbooks with like plastic and people would shove slices of pizza in there just so they could get, I don't know why. I don't think we ever wore the t-shirt, but it was just like a bragging rights. <laughs> I love it. I love it. See, you can really, that, uh, see, that's what I'm talking about. I love you. Bring me back memory lane. Mm. So where did you attend the college or where'd you go to school? I went to a Catholic university down in DC. So I was really big into theater when I was in high school up in Manasquan and Catholic had a top 10 theater program when um, I was going to college. And so I wound up down in DC and I majored in theater. And then my parents told me, and then you can major in something practical too. So I majored in theater and communications. Okay. Okay. So that, that, that led to my next, my next question then. So communications, did you ever think you would ever be on TV? I mean, I know you, you know, you were in theater, so you write, maybe I could be a movie or an actress on Broadway, but did you think you would be on TV reporting the news? It was really interesting, uh, the path that I took, because when I was in D.C., my senior year, I interned at ABC7, the TV station there. And so I did a lot of stuff behind the scenes there, and they actually hired me right out of college to do behind the scenes. Um, so it was an industry I was kind of a part of from the very beginning, but I started at like the bottom, bottom of TV. Like I was the one who was like running the scripts across the newsroom. Um, I remember my first opening salary was so low that my parents were wondering like why they sent me to college in the first place. But it was a really interesting way to learn the industry because then as I kind of moved up the ranks, I really understood every little part of the industry. And I think there's a lot more respect for that when you really work your way up. So I worked behind the scenes for a few years and then eventually transitioned to on camera. I mean, I was sweating coming in here before I came to see you today. Cause I'm like, she used to work in TV and media. So let me get all my P's and Q's ready because I know she's going to be like, no, that light got to be like this. Uh, you know? So I was nervous. I was like, all right, I, I practiced before I came here today. You are so funny. <laughs> to, no. make sure to, to make sure everything was cool. So how'd you end up in Charm City? 
How did I end up in Charm City? So in TV, like that career is just very nomadic, right? You have to move all over the country. Um, you go from place to place, job to job. So I was in DC behind the scenes and then eventually just sort of like everything happens. The recession closed one of the jobs, one of the bureaus I was working for. And I wound up getting transferred out to Columbus, Ohio. Um, which was honestly a great experience. The people out there were really lovely, but my parents were up in New Jersey. My family was all on the East Coast. And so I got offered the job at WJZ in Baltimore and I really leapt at the chance to come back to the East Coast. Um, so I worked at WJZ for almost five or maybe a little more than five years. Nice, nice. So how did you end up here? We were talking a little bit before that, before I got on air, but how'd you end up at the library? I mean, is, is that... Is that the next phase in life after you leave TV? Do you go into like, you know, private sector pretty much? You know, everyone has a different path, right? And so my contract was ending at WJZ and I really loved my experience there, but I was just looking for a new challenge and I was trying to figure out what that challenge was. So was it reporting national news and going to New York? So I was like actually interviewing in New York at the time. And then this job at the library um, came open and the timing was just Perfect. I was already a member of the Pratt Contemporaries, which is the philanthropy group um, for the library. So I was always really familiar with the Pratt Library. And then when the job opened, I kind of just applied and said, well, uh, you know, like you kind of worry <laughs> about it when they call you for an interview. And then when I went in and interviewed, it just got me excited and more and more interested. And so, I mean, it's really turned out to be a dream job and the transition has been really like amazing because I still get to tell stories. I just tell a lot of stories that have more happy endings because the library has such great um, work that we do. And it's a privilege to be able to tell the story of the library. I love it. I love it, folks. I love it, folks. So we're about to get into the meat of it right now about, uh -oh. the, about, the, about the library. Okay. So tell us, give us a little background because a lot of my listeners are not from Baltimore. Yep. A lot of them are all, all over. Tell us a little bit about Enoch Pratt Free Library. I mean, is I know they're all around the city, mm -hmm. um, but give us a little bit, you know, what you give us a little side, you know, a little cliff. The spiel, yeah. yeah. So the Enoch Property Library is actually one of the first free libraries in the entire country. Um, what we take for granted here in Baltimore City is that the Pratt Library is actually like a nationally renowned library. People who work here have learned about the Pratt Library in library school and coming here is like a huge part of their career because the reputation is so amazing. So we are the City Library of Baltimore. We have 22 locations, but we are also the State Library of Maryland. So it's a little bit different. Um, so in other states, like in New Jersey, there would be a State Library in Trenton that would you know, serve the entire state and then the individual counties and towns would have libraries. Here, this building that you're in right now, the Central Library, is also the State Library of Maryland. So we send books from this library to every county across the state of Maryland every single day. So if you are in Prince George's County and you want a book that is on the Eastern Shore and it's only there, our drivers will get it from the Eastern Shore to Prince George's County. So we basically like run a FedEx out of the basement of this building because that's our responsibility as the state library. So it's really neat. Um, we do a lot of great work. And then on top of that, the City Library of Baltimore, 22 locations across the city. And we also have three um, mobile units. So we have a mobile job center, which is equipped with 13 computer terminals. So people get on the mobile job center. We can teach them how to do a resume. We They leave with copies of their resume. We can help them apply for jobs. So all kinds of things on the mobile job center that travels all over the city. And then we also have a book buggy, which is for our little kids. So we do story time right on the book buggy. It's really like a lot of imagination. Olivia the pig is on the outside of it, which kids love. And then we have a bookmobile, which is essentially a library on wheels that travels all over the city. So we're everywhere. You just blew my mind right now. <laughs> I'm going to have to bring that back and uh, listen to that again, because I did not know you guys were the books of, you guys are the Amazon of books for Maryland. It is like no <laughs> doubt. For Amazon, like you guys are like, if you, if I need a book on Eastern Shore, Project Maryland, Hagerstown, yeah. 
come through here. We can get it to you. We also do library. So like, say you have a book that you really want and it is only in Alaska. We can get that book from Alaska for you. And so we get books from all over the world for people. And we have some books that get shipped all over the world so that, you know, it's access to information and knowledge. And we try and find it anywhere we can to make sure our customers are happy. Wow. Wow, folks. (laughs) <laughs> Megan McCork was dropping jewels and gems as we say, as we say I mean, we just dropping just truth bombs giving us that inside information so how many people are employed for the app from the library sure we have about 500 employees across the library system wow, wow. give or take yeah that, that's just great that's, that's great to hear mm-hmm. so I know the library went through some different phases and I was looking at you know I was looking at the Instagram account Things were changing inside here. To yeah. give us a walk through of the phases of what happened, what it looked like before and looked like afterwards, like what changed inside with the phase. You were saying it took about how many years to get everything fixed up in here in 10 years, something like that, for the facelift? Oh, you're talking about the, the renovation. Yeah, the, sorry, renovation. That's renovation. okay. So, yes, the Central Library just underwent a massive renovation. It was a $115 million renovation. Woo! Yeah. It was a heavy price tag, but <laughs> with a building like this that's historic, I mean, you can't do it any other way. You have to bring in artists to redo these ceilings, right? There were techniques to doing some of our molding, our historic molding, that they had to use the same technique that they used in the 1930s when they put the building up because there's just not a modern technique that can get you how, how decorative that molding is. I mean, it was magical to see. So it took about 20 years to get the funding to do a full facelift facelift of this building. Um, And one of the things that we're really proud of is that we kept the central library open the entire time of the renovation. We'd close for maybe a week here and there, but this building sees like half a million visitors a year and people rely on it. And we know that we are some of the only places that people can access computers where kids can do homework after school in a quiet, safe space. So it was important for us to keep the building open So it took about three and a half years, but we were able to renovate the building top to bottom. It was the first full-scale renovation of this building. Um, This building is eight floors. People don't realize that because when you look outside, it just looks like three floors. So what we go four floors underground as well. Oh, okay. It's pretty amazing. So three floors underground are three full, um, they're, they're stacks of books. So we have like, two city blocks of books on each floor and then a sub basement below that. So when you are coming here and saying like, Hey, I'm looking for this fiction book and you don't see it on the shelf. If you ask a librarian, they've got to go downstairs and they weave through three full city blocks of books to find you your book. It's amazing. If you love the smell of old books, I love walking down in the stacks. Wow. Yeah. Folks. Wow. Wow. It's an wow. amazing, amazing building to be in, to um, just the artistic, uh, it's won so many awards for the renovation because just, I say we're a building of ceilings. I laughed and said like, we should pad all the pillars because people <laughs> are just going to look at the ceilings and walk into them because <laughs> the amount of craftsmanship that went into this building back in 1933 just can't be repeated anymore in new buildings. Um, it's really a magical, special place. It, it is beautiful. It's beautiful here, folks. I mean, again, it took my breath away just walking in and I just looked up and I was like, wow, I do feel like I'm in Rome, the cathedrals. I, yeah. I mean, this this is a beautiful architecture. So mm-hmm. before the pandemic, we're, we're going we're to go a little bit before the pandemic. Yep. You guys had a speaker series that you guys used to do all the time. We kept it during the pandemic. Uh-oh. We did it virtually. So virtually. It never ended. It never. What's the name of it and how did this come about and how do you guys get, get your guests? What, how does it all work? We have a few different speaker series that all have different missions. So Writers Live is our main speaker series um, where we really focus on authors. We have a new speaker series that launched maybe a year or two ago called the Hackerman Best and Next series. So those are really um artists and thought leaders that we bring in. And then we have the Brown Lecture Series that focuses on prominent African-American leaders. So we have three different series that uh, we do sort of simultaneously. And we have an amazing programming department that really brings in all of those speakers. So that is their job. Um, The Pratt Library is actually really known nationally for our programs. Um, Mm. 
our CEO, Heidi Daniel, used to work down in um, Houston, Texas. And she said her CEO down in Houston, Texas would get our magazine into like their library and then give it to their programming staff and say like, figure out how to do what the Pratt's doing. Wow. Because yeah, other libraries try and emulate what we do a lot. How often are, how often are those series? Like when, like before pre pandemic, was it like once a month or were you guys doing it? I mean, and what kind of crowd were you getting? Like, Cause I saw one, you guys had um, D Watkins here one day and uh, it was packed. Um, I mean, and I was like, this is a Tuesday or Wednesday night and it's packed down here. Dee Watkins was one of our last speakers before the pandemic. Yep. And we had a thousand people in central library. We can fit 500 people in central hall. We had every overflow space that you could think of. Cause we can stream now with our new technology in the building. So we streamed up to Wheeler auditorium that fits like another 200. We did the creative arts center, which we can fit a few other hundred. We were in the Poe room, which was one of our smaller spaces, but we can stream to it. So for big speakers, we can fit up to a thousand people in this building. So I, I remember that. I just remember that was one of my last memories of seeing that. And I was like, there's a lot of people in there. Last year, the year after we reopened the library, we wanted it to be this community celebration, this banner year. We did a reopening celebration for the library um, and it was a block party. And we, had, you know, there's no way of knowing how many people are going to come to something. <laughs> and so we were like, you know what? If we have like two or 3,000 people, that would be great through the course of the day. We had over 9,000 people show up on a Saturday afternoon to tour the library. Like it, the doors, it never ended. When we cut the ribbon to the library, I couldn't get in the front door for so long. I went around back and went in the back door because there was such a line to get in. It's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pausing for a second because we're, we're post kind of past pandemic and I can't imagine that in my mind now of that many, I, know. I can eat like the, the thought of that many people gives me the creeps now. <laughs> it, it, it does. Right? It does. It's like, cause just because of what I know, what we know about the world now, mm -hmm. it's just like 9,000 people 9,000 people throughout the course of the, the day. fire marshal didn't come in here and say hey y'all gotta it was throughout the course <laughs> of the day no i think they gave us a pass on that one we you, always say like mm. you know what i love though i um and I, I i i love that people are still coming to the library that's one of the big things i always going to ask you about because the you look at the internet you know, I we I we grew up with Encarta and all that right? stuff. You know, <laughs> you know we had everybody's parents had the diction had the had the alphabet dictionary. <laughs> world book the world, encyclopedia. We all had that. Yeah, you remember? That. And you know, library was a place to go. That's where you checked out. You know, the tape. That's where you checked out things in that nature. And now it's like internet has taken over. Do you have you guys seen a decrease of like visitors as far as young people come to the library, or do you guys take note of that because you can Google everything? So. How do you guys counter that? I'm just curious. Well, we like to say librarians are the original Google and mm. we give you accurate information. So we'll tell you like what on Google is true and what's not. <laughs> um, I actually think it's the opposite. We see a lot more people. Um, and one of the big reasons is that many, many years ago, uh, we really realized that internet is not equal across the city. There's over 40% of households in Baltimore city that does not have access to reliable internet within their home. And in many cases, the library is the only place that they can go. That's completely free that they can do their homework or they can look for a job. And so we know people rely on the Pratt library, um, especially for that free internet. And during the pandemic, that was one of our number one concerns is, okay, they can't access our internet. We know they need it. How can we get it to them? So one of the things that we did almost immediately um, is we put antennas on the outside of eight of our libraries so that people could access internet in the parking lot of our libraries or outside. So we called it drive-in Wi-Fi. We're looking to expand that even further in the like coming years because say you're a kid who's you know doing the homework assignment that you forgot and the library closed at seven o'clock. Well then you could at least sit outside the library at eight o'clock and use our free internet. Um, you don't have to go to Starbucks and try and like buy something to sit there and use their internet. We also have, um, we bought a ton of uh, mobile hotspots. And so people can check those out like a book, bring them home. And I think it's like up to 15 devices in your home can connect to free internet using the mobile hotspot. This makes my heart warm. I'm, I'm literally about to tear up because what you're saying is what Baltimore really needs. I, I, always remember this. It was a scene 
when everybody was going back to um was all school you know schools online and there was a young person that was in California and I don't know if you remember this they were at Taco Bell sitting outside doing their homework mm-hmm. and I'm like wait a minute, we live in the United States of America. Like, what are we doing here? Like, exactly. you're doing homework outside Taco Bell to get your homework done. And for to hear what you guys are doing, kudos to you. Thank you so much for what you are doing for the public, for the kids out here, people who don't have internet. I mean, what you said about the job resumes, you know, the, the spots you can go into the mobile centers, that is heartwarming because I think people need to hear that beautiful side of Baltimore and what we have here in resources. So, I mean, I'm right now about to tear up a little bit because that just really makes my heart warm hearing that. I think people, when they think about a library, and if you haven't been to the library in a long time, you look at like, that's a place I can get books. But the library is so much more. I always like to say our business is access. And that's it. Like access to information. And that information comes in a lot of different ways, Right. It can come because you can log on to a computer. It can come from a book. It can come from one of our programs. Um, I mean, we have access to everything. We open up a world for people that's completely free that they wouldn't be able to get anywhere else. I mean, my boss, our CEO, Heidi Daniel, grew up in a town where her dad was a factory worker in Michigan. And the library was one of the only places that opened the world to her and showed her that there was a world beyond where she was growing up. I mean, and it grew her love of libraries. Her parents wanted her to go to college and they brought her to the library all the time because it was a free source of information. So she always really instills that in all of us, how important this library is. And in Baltimore City, I think people really look at the Pratt Library as a place that fixes problems. And we do as much as we can. I mean, we've got programs, we've got lawyer in the library. We were one of the first places to start that in Maryland. Um, We started at our Pennsylvania Avenue branch. So if you need legal help with a civil issue, you can actually come to the library and meet with an attorney and they will give you free legal advice through Maryland Legal Aid. We have had people line up around the building to do that. It's so popular. We've expanded it to multiple libraries. We've continued doing it um, on a like remote basis. That spawned another program because we noticed that People needed access to food stamps or other resources that our librarians could only do so much, right? And you could only say social services across the street, but people didn't trust it, right? They trusted the library because it's a place of trust that they've always come to. So we started social worker in the library. So now we have social work interns working at all of our library branches. So if our librarian notices that someone needs help with something, we have someone right there that can help you. So, I mean, it's really interesting and it's so um, heartwarming to work here because I really do see this place as a a place that looks at what do the people of Baltimore need and how can we be part of that solution? Wow. See, I'm I'm learning right now, folks. I mean, (laughs) I'm literally about to have my pen and paper when I listen to this episode (laughs) afterwards and write this down because I don't think a lot of people know What's, what this library does until I'm, I mean, maybe I'm just oblivious to the world, but I didn't know about a lot of this. And you're, you're, I mean, I feel like I'm in class right now. <laughs> School's in session. And, you know, I mean, I'm sitting here like, wow, this is amazing. This is so great that we have these resources here. Yeah, we're a community anchor. And honestly, I always think like when people need something, they come to us. We had a woman the other day who her sliding glass door wouldn't close or wouldn't open. There was something. And one of our librarians put it on the neighborhood Facebook page and helped get somebody to her house to help get her door closed. I mean, that's the type of caring people that work here. Our staff is amazing. And if they can find a way to help you, even if it's not within their expertise, they're going to do it. I love it. I love it. So let's talk about pandemic. Let's, let's lie that because I know that's, everybody wants to know. How did the library survive the pandemic? I mean, you say you have 500 employees. Were you guys able to keep them, retain them? Were you guys able to help them out, uh, have hours for them? I mean, what kind of things did you guys do for the community? I know you said for Wi-Fi and things, for, sure. for, but pandemic, like checking out books. Was there, I know you get drive-through books or something like that, or pick up books or something like that. I don't know. But tell me, tell the audience a little bit about that. Sure. Well, we did keep all of our staff and we hired more staff. So, wow. um, yes, because... 
we knew I mean, from the second we closed our doors, all we were thinking about is how do we open our doors and how do we meet the needs of our community? So the digital divide obviously was a really big piece for us. But the other thing was, OK, well, we have a lot of kids that come in from school and they need help with their homework. And now we can't stand over them and help them with their homework. So what do we do? So we immediately beefed up our digital resources. We brought a database that you could access from home that had free live tutors on it. So we did this, like say your child is taking algebra or something and your algebra skills are <laughs> not quite what they used to be. You could actually log on to that tutoring service and the tutor would have an online blackboard and like help your child do the problem and help them learn it all for free with your library card. You just had to log in. That was one of the first things we did. And then we reached out to schools and we're asking, what more do you need? So we beefed up a lot of our online resources for people. That was the first thing we did. Um, we increased the amount of money we were spending on our eBooks because we knew that people couldn't come in and get physical books right away. So you could still download eBooks. So I always laugh, like I yell at my friends when they tell me they download from Amazon because you can download all of the latest books completely free on your Kindle from the library. You might have to wait a little bit because um, we do have some wait times, but we've got ebooks, e audiobooks, all we have movies, we have music, all the latest albums you can download from Hoopla almost immediately with no wait. So, I mean, it's pretty amazing all of the. I mean, I get. the pandemic happened. They kept on trucking. That is amazing. We never stopped. And the one thing that I was really proud of is like, you know, kids come for story time every week, right? And right. early literacy is vitally important. And so many people get that at the library. We were up and doing Facebook live story times within like two weeks. And mm. we still do those today because people love them. So we started doing online programming um, and you know, we've worked out the kinks of it. And I really think it's something even post pandemic that people like. And so we're really taking a look at what did we do during the pandemic that we can translate now. Like we're not going to be the same library after this. You have to take the lessons learned and see like instead of doing those thousand person um, programs in Central Hall, we could still have those those people. But I understand that it's very hard in Baltimore City if I live somewhere that's not on a bus line that I got to take three buses to get to Central Library to see Spike Lee but maybe I could get it streamed to my local library and just walk there and I could still participate in the program. So we're really taking a look at what technology do we need so that we can be more inclusive with our communities and provide access in an easier way for people so that they can all participate in what we're doing. Do you see like, like the Maryland zoo, for example, they now are doing time to go into the zoo. And it seems like that's something that they're taking from the pandemic going forward. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the aquarium, what the aquarium does. Sure. Do you see the library doing something like that? Where, like, say, for instance, you have another big speaker like, uh, I don't know, Barack Obama that comes here. You know it's going to sell out. Sure. Would you still have that thousand or would you kind of limit it down? Kind of like you're saying, like maybe 500 to max we're going to do. And we're going to stream in other, other avenues. What I can say is, so for Spike Lee, that was probably the biggest one that we did right before the pandemic. Um, we did do tickets. They were free tickets. Um, and then we had like a wait line, like if we could fit you in, just because we knew that we couldn't accommodate everybody in the building. Um, so I, I think for big scale programs like that, it's possible to do that. For someone like Dee Watkins, when you can really fill the room with a thousand people and watch all these people stream in, I mean, I still think that there's a magic okay. to that, to see how many people on a Tuesday night really want to come to the library um, to see some of these amazing speakers. So I still think it would be limited. I think what we really want to do is figure out how to provide access to the people that couldn't have made it down here for mm. Spike Lee, right? And so maybe it's not necessarily streaming it into your home, but it could be streaming it into your local library. We could also potentially stream things online. So we're taking a look at what we could do. I mean, right now our author programs have continued and we're doing those through our Facebook Live. So we had Jenna Bush Hager 
Saw um, that. I saw yeah, that. I saw who that. did? She did a great thing with Elizabeth Gilbert from Eat, Pray, Love was with us um, a few weeks ago. She was amazing. But we get people on our Facebook Live say like, "I'm tuning in from Indiana. I'm tuning in from <laughs> Australia." I mean, we're getting a whole different audience there. So you really look at like, how do we retain that audience mm-hmm. while still um, servicing the audience that we have right here in Baltimore City? So possibly it could be like a whole mix of a hodgepodge. You don't have to have somebody come here anymore. You can just do it. Virtual now, pretty much. There's something really <laughs> special, though, about seeing someone in person. So I think we would still really um, desire having those in-person experiences, but being able to stream it from this library yeah. into other libraries or into homes. So for people who can't make it here, you could potentially watch it at home and you could watch it on your own time, right? Because we have it on our Facebook Live page. It lives there. And when speakers allow us to do that, then if I can't, make it on Tuesday night at eight o'clock. I could watch it on Thursday at four o'clock when I have time. Right. 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 So the other question now, is I asked you before we got on, before we got on camera. All right. So they throw this huge party every year. Uh-oh. And I, and I, you know, I would watch my Instagram. Like, I need uh-huh. to, you know, you'd be still stalking on Instagram. Let me look at Facebook. Look, 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 uh-huh. And these people are dressed up to the nines. They had different themes every year. Give us a little peek behind the curtain of what you, because I I'm, remember looking at your Instagram and you were like, this, I mean, working hard this week. And then you, at the end, you always said, shout out to my staff for crushing it there. And you always take a picture with them. Tell us, give us a little peek behind the curtain. What is, what is this party that happens every okay. year that didn't happen last year? And is it going to happen this year? Or gonna, we're working on okay, it. Okay. We, we're working on cause, it. Cause, Cause I feel like I'm about to get up on this ticket somehow. Yeah. Right? I, Cause I got convinced, but go ahead. So that is the Pratt Contemporaries black and white party. So I mentioned that I was involved in the library before I actually started working here. And I was a member of the Pratt Contemporaries, which is our young professionals philanthropy group for the library. So we do monthly events. Um, we, had some really fun events besides the black and white party, including like a spelling bee where you might get a little tipsy (laughs) in between and then try and spell words like an adult spelling bee. And we do all kinds of really fun things. Um, We, you know, tour brand new restaurants all together and it's all um, in support of the library. So it helps raise money Mm. specifically for teen and children's programming here in the library. So, The big event of the year for the Pratt Contemporaries is the Black and White Party. And so we have it here at the Central Library. There is a theme every year, and it's usually a literary theme. So like a few themes ago, it was Alice in Wonderland. Um, A couple years ago was The Wizard of Oz. And so we (laughs) trick out the library. I mean, it looks like a different place. It really, like my favorite part of the Black and White Party is when you just walk in because it's just magical. The whole place is transformed. And it's really just a big party that supports the library. Um, The tickets are very hard to get. They generally sell out within minutes. Mm. Um, But my trick or my tip is if you are a member of the Pratt Contemporaries, we have different membership levels. And so if you join like a higher level membership, you actually automatically get some tickets to the black and white party. If you join at our base level membership, you get access to the pre-sale for those tickets. So that is really the way into the party because it has gotten more and more popular every single year. And I'm sure if we are able to have it this year, it's going to be more popular than ever. I mean, as what I've been hearing, they're calling this the roaring twenties again. Oh my gosh. That's what everybody's saying. I'd be so happy if we had a twenties theme. That's what it, cause I said, I need some fringe in my life. uh, You know what? I did a Gatsby party a couple of years before and that we did the fringe and, Mm -hmm. Definitely we did love Gatsby it. already, so we have to think of a new theme. But it's going to be the Roaring Twenties again. Think about it. It's the Twenties. Oh, no. You got, you know. We'll it, have to think of something. Think of something. But There's uh, an entire committee that plans that party. Okay. I mean, and they, like, every detail is worked out to perfection. Wow. And the theme is always, like, the biggest thing that gets decided. So they work really hard. They're a group of volunteers who are amazing. And the Pratt Contemporaries in general is a group that's about 300 strong. And they're just people that believe in Baltimore and believe in the library. And that's what this podcast is about. Yeah. And so I had a couple of questions. A couple of people were asking, how was the library funded? I had, a, I had that question. People were asking, because I'm like, I'm going into the library. Like, how do they get money? How do we get money? How okay, we- so we are the State Library of Maryland, so we get money from the state. Okay. We also get money from the city. So our money from both the state and the city keeps the doors open and the lights on and the employees paid, right? Okay. 
We have a group of incredibly generous private donors um, and grants that fund all of our programs. So every story time you go to, every, um, you know, the mobile job center, the um, the author programs, those amazing author programs, all of that is privately funded. And it's from the generosity of donors who believe that things like that should be free for the people of Baltimore. And how long would it take me to get a library card? If I was a listener trying to say, I'm, I'm gonna, can, I, can I do it from online or do I have to come in or how do, how do I get a long library card? Well, you can do it in just a few minutes. So you can go online and we have the e-card. Um, and so that would get you access to any of our digital resources. So you can access all your library resources from home. I do that because I'll finish a book at like 11 o'clock at night and then I need a new book immediately and I can at least <laughs> download it right away. Um, and then if you come in after you get your e-card, they'll just upgrade you to a regular card. Um, but yeah, it's really simple. You just, if you're coming into one of our 22 locations, you just fill out an application and anyone who is a resident of the state of Maryland can get a Pratt card since we're the state library. All right. I love it. I love it. And they're it. free, of course. People, I love it. Free. A lot of people don't realize that the library is free. I always say free is our middle name. Everything's free. Free to Baltimore. Is that yep. a free to, that's, that's free a to Maryland. Uh, free to Maryland. Yes. Yes. Yep. So we're going to go into the, the last part of the episode. For interview. Okay, last part interview. Here we go. Okay. This is the speed round. Oh gosh, this, okay. This is the fun. This is the fun. Who is your favorite author? It's like asking someone if I know, pick I their know. favorite child. All right, top three, top three authors. I would say so my favorite book is The Alchemist by okay. Paolo Coelho. That's what I read. Like I go back to it every few years and read it. So that's what I would okay. start with. All right. What's your favorite race to run? Because I know you're a runner. I love the soul of the city. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's around the Harbor. It's beautiful. And it was actually the first race I ever ran. It was the first 10 K I ever ran. And I like initially never believed I could run that far. <laughs> and eventually then I did half marathons after that, but the soul of the city holds a special place in my heart. Cause it was the first like time I ever really felt like a runner <laughs> and it's beautiful. I mean the Balt it's a truly Baltimore race. I do also love Baltimore marathon day. I think it's the most fun day in Baltimore city. I love cheering on the marathon runners. Okay. See my thing is the St. Patrick 5k. I always do oh, that. that I love, it's a fun one. I always say <laughs> just, as long as you don't fall down that hill. The on hill Charles going Street, down. Right? That's, that's, yeah, it's that's... a little dodgy on that hill, especially cause it's one o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Everyone's right, right. You already fun. You already know. You already know. <laughs> so crabs or crab cakes? I like the ceremony of crabs. Like I like that you have to crack them, that you do it with a big group. So I would say crabs just because it's it evokes like an experience. You know, I like that. I, I'm, I'm, it's funny. I want to do an episode on that because I think crabs are, the reason I like crabs better than crab cakes is because everybody has to put their cell phone down. You're talking. You all your hands. Yeah. You're talking. Mm -hmm. There's nobody interrupting. Mm -hmm. you're, it's a conversation now. And it's not like you do that by yourself, right? Like right. you don't have crabs by yourself. Like it's no, a group it's of a people. Group. It's a ritual. It is. Something to it. I love it. I yeah. love it. All right. Flats or drums for chicken wings? I would say flats because you can put more sauce on those. Ranch or blue cheese? Both. Uh, uh oh, we're gonna. Uh, I don't uh -oh. know. I mean, like on different. I mean, like listen, ranch. I would put ranch on almost anything, but I also like blue cheese. <laughs> it's always that's always a hot that's topic. That's a really tough one. That's a tough one. Old Bay hot sauce or Frank's red hot sauce. I feel like it's Maryland. I gotta go with Old Bay. Old Bay's like on everything around here, so I'm going with Old Bay. What is the best advice you've ever received? That's such a tough one. I think my dad is someone who I always turn to advice and I, he's always sort of instilled in me that you're really responsible for your own happiness and you can only control how you react to a situation. So I've always tried and really live with that. Like you choose joy, you choose to be happy, even within the situations. You know, when I was working in TV news, I used to always tell my photographers, if we don't laugh at least once today, we have done it wrong. So I just feel like, yeah, that's probably the best advice my dad kind of instilled in me. Now, here's a mystery question. I, 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 this wasn't on my list. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I'm coming. We'll see, we'll see where you're going to come with this. Okay. Ocean City or Belmar Beach? <laughs> Can I choose mine? <laughs> so, the Jersey Shore or, or, or Avalon, Jersey. I like Avalon. I like that beach a little bit. 
I would do New Jersey. My grandma had a beach house growing up on Manasquan, so I'm Manasquan. always partial. Like Manasquan, it was a town that like all the beach houses were little small beach houses. There's no like high rises. There's nothing like super fancy about it. That's what I loved about. So I always like sort of yearn for a beach that's very similar. That feels like home to me. Ocean City has the high rises yeah. and everything. It's like too much for me. And you know, Belmar is a little bit too much. <laughs> it's, it's a little too crazy. It's a little bit. It's a little bit. Yeah, 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 just a little bit. <laughs> People from Jersey know what we're talking about. Oh, yeah. Can you tell us where we can find you guys on social media? Are you guys on TikTok yet? Because that's where all... I'm on TikTok. And I'm like, I have no idea. I'm like putting things around. I have no idea what I'm doing. Because that's like... TikTok is like the... I was fighting it, but now I, I understand it. I get it now. Yeah. So we, if you go on our website, prattlibrary.org, Pratt it will link you to all of our social media pages. So we are on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We've not gotten into TikTok yet. And, you know, it's a debate between all of us because I feel like to be successful in TikTok, you have to be really consistent with it. And it's a <laughs> lot of work that goes into it. So, I mean, it's something we're thinking about, but we also have to figure out... Do we have the staff to do it and keep it entertaining? And so, so we're thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've seen lawyers, I've seen lawyers to talk on TikTok. So you guys, you, I mean, I call it the TikTok. I just go on the, I'm there for like an hour. Like how did I, this yeah, hour of what? You just looking, lost time. I lost time. Yeah. But just like, I mean, walking into Pratt library, TikTok, I don't know. I think it'd be kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, it's something we're talking about and thinking about. So I'm sure it'll be coming in the future. Any last things you want to say to the audience just listening? Because I really, really, you dropped so many jewels and gems. I'm blown away. I am so happy that I, you know, I reached out and you reached right back and yeah. you're like, Aaron, let's make it happen. I'm like, let's do it. And I'm just, again, shout give a shout out to your podcast. Come on, we got to talk about your podcast. Oh, yeah. Give a shout out to the podcast on here. Thank you. We do the Free to Be More podcast. Um, and yeah, we're really excited about it. Um, we talk to people who are really making a difference in the city of Baltimore. So it's really inspiring. I feel like we learn something Every single episode, we try and be really, really timely. Um, we are going into our fourth season of the podcast, which I can't believe that we've been at it for four years. Congratulations. Um, thank you. It's it's really exciting. But but yeah, you can find out everything about the library at prattlibrary.org. And the one thing I always say to people, because a lot of people say like, oh, I don't need the library. Like, I dare you. There is something here for you. There's something here for everybody. I dare people to walk in and not find at least one thing that's here for them. Will do. Will do. Well, folks, love, peace, and happiness, and thanks for listening to No Picks of Dark Podcast. We're out.